September. Oh, oh thank you so much. I've heard about that. Um, thank you for that. And so in September, we're going to be having our next large meeting in this group, and we'll be publishing out our needs, needs assessment based on this inventory results. And we'll be spending pretty much all of the next um, year working on developing and implementing solutions with you all and other stakeholders and publishing a final report of this project. So with that, um, we would like to go ahead and get started with um, our presentations here. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Erin um, Beckett, again, from the Department of Revenue, and I'll let her take it away. Okay, good morning. Let me go ahead. Um, so now it doesn't want to let me share my screen, just so you know. Yeah, I just need to, I need to okay. get, out of, get out of your way. One moment. Okay. <laughs> uh, awesome. All right, should be good to go. Thank you. Are you guys able to see that? Are you seeing my presentation? Yep, okay, wonderful. Um, so good morning, my name is Erin Beckett. I am the lead of the crash unit within the Division of Motor Vehicles under the Department of Revenue. Um, and I'm gonna cover what the Colorado Department of Revenue's process is for the DR3447 crash report. Um, so we actually start with a manual crash process where physical reports get sent to our mail and retrieval or our MARS unit. Um, this unit scans all of our reports into our drive system. These then come into a crash data entry, entry queue where crash unit employees pull the reports to data enter them into our system. The typical turnaround time from mail processing to posted report can take up to 10 days uh, and reports can be submitted um, via mail, email, or electronic faxes from various police agencies. Um, and all investigated crash re reports that occur on Colorado roadways are stored and archived in the drive system. Um, there's also an electronic crash process. So police agencies work with third party software vendors who create programs that are also known as record management systems or RMS um, that allow the police departments to data enter their own reports. These reports are then uploaded into our drive system through an application programming interface or API. Uh, if the RMS detects errors on the report as they're being uploaded, the report will get rejected back to the agency before it ever reaches the Department of Revenue. Um, there are certain errors that do come through and we manually correct those. Um, those errors will come into a queue where the crash unit um, manually gets in there and takes care of them. And the turnaround time is about five days to correct and post those electronic reports. So um, I'm gonna talk about the corrections that we do on manual crash reports. So the crash unit will data enf enter the information that we see on each crash report. We do not change information that would affect the integrity of the overall report. We will correct certain required fields in order to get a report completed and posted in drives. So information that we will uh, change or correct would include checking the investigated at box scene if it's not already checked. And that is only after reading the narrative and determining the crash was indeed investigated. We'll also look for indicators like if a citation was issued, that's usually an indication that the crash was investigated. Um, we will also determine if a report occurred on private property as we do not process private property crashes. So um, there is a box on the DR3447 that they can check for private property that doesn't always happen. And so if a crash occurs in a parking lot or in a private driveway, um, that, that's something we won't actually key or enter into our system. We will also update or remove the arrival, roadway cleared, and the time the last responders left, if those times are listed prior to the time of the crash um, occurring, or if they're not entered into military time. Um, we'll remove a zero for human contributing factor on the report if the driver action is listed as a 17, which is considered careless driving. Um, and then finally, we will add commercial information for any commercial vehicles if the vehicle is registered in Colorado. There are certain required fields for commercial vehicles, such as the gross vehicle weight rating, 
that if it's not on the report and we can obtain that through our system, we will go ahead and add it to the report. All of that is to get the report entered and posted into our system. That is why we would make those changes. There are certain changes that cannot, there's errors that we can't correct that have to go back to the police agencies to correct on their end. So this includes if mandatory pages are not included. So like the traffic unit general vehicle and CMV page of the report, that's actually a page that goes hand in hand with the traffic unit page. Um, so the traffic unit page lists all the driver information, insurance information, the traffic unit general vehicle page lists details like what type of vehicle, like an SUV or commercial vehicle, what was the roadway speed limit, and what were the driver actions and human contributing factors, which is all important data that we use um, to figure out why we have so many crashes. Um, so all of that information is important, and if those pages are not included, we have to send them back to obtain that. Um, we also have to send back if the number of injuries listed on the header page doesn't match the injuries listed on the all involved or the driver occupant detail section. Um, we cannot change the injury status of a driver, passenger, or non-motorist. Uh, we also reject back if fatal details are missing. So if the date um, a fatal occurred or somebody um, was deceased, declared deceased, then that has to be sent back. Also, if diagrams are missing, diagrams are required for fatal and serious injury crashes. Obviously, that's not something we can just come up with. That has to go back to the police agency to provide that information. Um, and then adding commercial information for vehicles registered out of state. So that includes carrier name, gross vehicle weight rating, as I stated previously, is required, um, and DOT number if they have that. Um, and finally, if a, an amended report is submitted and there is no original in our system, we are required to have both an original as well as an amended. So if it's not included with the amended report, that has to go back to obtain the original. Um, and when a crash report is submitted for manual processing and we find errors on it, we do re reject that back to the police agency. When we do that, we provide a letter along with a copy of the crash report, um, and it details what needs to be corrected. But we want to make it clear that there is no specified time frame for when these errors must be corrected and sent back to the Department of Revenue. So unfortunately, this, I guess the point of this is to um, help you understand that that's why we will go in and correct certain required fields to try to get the information into our system. Because when we reject it back, we have absolutely no idea how long it'll take to receive that corrected report back into our system. Now we also, get electronic reports that have errors on them. Um, not all errors get rejected back to the agency immediately. Some of them do come back to us. And when electronic reports come through with errors, they actually go into a specific queue that the crash unit goes in and corrects. So the errors actually, this, this is the first one, uh, the time error. So you can see they're stating the time of the crash is listed at 1025 and the arrival time and time roadway cleared was listed as 1005. The system doesn't like that, so we don't assume anything. We will delete the times and just take them out of the equation altogether because we can't determine when they arrived or when the roadway was cleared. The other type of time error that we see is when um, the time isn't entered as military time. So in this case, we actually will go and take a look at the lighting conditions that are listed on the crash report. And in this case, it'll say daylight. We know that that means that this was 1226 PM, not AM. And we're gonna change the time the last responder left to 1317. Once again, because we want this report to post in our system and be available. Um, and then this is one that we actually see quite often. So this is not a Colorado driver's license number. We're also not going to assume we know what state a driver's license was issued from. So they may have a Texas address. We're not going to put Texas in there because it might have been issued out of California. We don't know. Once again, we never assume anything. So we'll just delete Colorado as the driver's license state, leave it blank, and allow the report to post through the system.
And then this, we just see this a lot. So I thought I'd include this. Um, it's supposed to be middle initial. Our system doesn't like it when it's the full name. So we have to remove that and just put the initial. And then finally, uh, this is what it looks like when we have a zero for a human contributing factor when the when the driver action is listed as careless driving, which is a 17. Um, and the the reason is, you know, this data that we get on these reports is very important. We track all of this information and we do use it to try to create campaigns to make our roadways safer. Um, so all the details matter on these reports. And so some of the data elements that we track, of course, we track our fatal crashes. We track DUI and drug impaired crash related crashes, um, driver actions, careless driving, driving too fast for conditions or speeding. Um, what were the human contributing factors? Was the driver fatigued or were they evading law enforcement or were they distracted? Um, and then of course we're tracking non-motorist crashes because those are occurring a lot more. There's a lot more bicyclists on the road. Unfortunately, a lot more pedestrians making contact with vehicles. So we're really taking a look at those now. And then finally, we're also um, tracking crash data by age groups. And that also helps us create marketing campaigns directed at a specific age group to try to help reduce the number of crash crashes occurring on Colorado roadways. Um, the Department of Revenue also receives CORA requests, which is the Colorado Open Records Act. So we re receive these requests for crash data. When we receive these requests, we do remove military ID and driver's license numbers, any citation numbers drivers may have uh, received, license plate numbers and VIN information, including on any trailers that might have been involved. Uh, we remove insurance policy numbers and, of course, non-motorist driver's license numbers if those happen to be included. Um, and finally, the Colorado Department of Revenue works very closely with other state and federal agencies to share data and work towards reducing the number of fatal and serious injury crashes. So that includes working with CDOT, Colorado Department of Transportation, um, Colorado State Patrol, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, Federal Highway Administration, the Colorado Division, and the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. All of us have the same goal to reduce the number of fatal and serious injury crashes that occur on roadways. So that's all I've got today. Does anybody have any questions for me? Okay. Uh, I actually do, if that's, if you have just a really quick moment. Sure, of course. Just, um, and this is a Kenneth Bryan with Muller Engineering. I just uh, wanted to clarify, did you say that um, you don't allow no uh, contributing factor if uh, careless driving is the citation? Right. So uh, if the human contributing factor is listed as a zero, we have to remove it in our system in, in order to get that report to post. Why, why That's why that? we remove it. And so it just goes in as a blank instead of none? Correct, because as you saw, it comes up as an error in our system because on previous, so like with the DR2447 and now with the 3447, um, it's always been listed that if you are putting careless driving as the driver action, your human contributing factor is not supposed to be a zero. You're supposed to provide a specific reason why they were careless driving. And as I said, there's a list, you know, were they distracted? Were they evading right. law enforcement, you know? Um, but yeah, because at the end of the day, we we also have a, a timeliness that we have to get these reports into our system. And so um, we will remove the zero, you know? I mean, zero may as well be a blank anyway. It's not telling us any information. So okay. removing it doesn't affect the data that we're getting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, well, I just want to let you know that you can always contact myself um, via email. This also lists my manager's um, information, Justine Gonzalez, and then also our crash unit email inbox. Um, feel free to reach out with any questions or concerns. We're always happy to answer those. And I just want to say thank you so much for allowing me to present today and giving me your time and attention. I hope you all have a great day. All right, thank you so much, Aaron.
Um, okay. Now I'd like to turn it over to um, Alyssa Heron and David Swinka over at the Department of Transportation. All right, thank you guys so much. Uh, can you guys see the PowerPoint slide? Okay, cool. All right, so um, if I can get this to walk great. All right, hi everybody, my name is Alyssa Heron. I am a crash data analyst over at CDOT. Um, I work under Dave Swanka in the uh, traffic and safety unit. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about uh, the crash data workflow on CDOT side. Um, particularly, we're gonna be talking about the reviewing and the cleaning of the crash data. Um, in general, uh, between the time of a crash and when we receive the crash data, it's about 90 days. Uh, we mine the data uh, for specific things like determining the crash type, um, number of passengers, speed, weather, that kind of thing. Um, law enforcement officers will provide things like uh, the city, uh, the direction, movement, and things like that. Um, Every crash report that's received is reviewed by CDOT for completeness and accuracy. Um, and we record, uh, our records are edited and with supplementary info like the highways, the mile markers, geolocating and that kind of thing. Um, so this is kind of what our normal day-to-day -day looks like. Um, each individual line with the, the orange button is an individual record. And on this screenshot alone, there's about 50 mandatory corrections that need to be made. Um, you can see a few of the lat longs are missing. Those are definitely becoming more and more common, um, but they're definitely not uh, to the point where uh, our stakeholders are not asking us for more of them. <laughs> um, so definitely areas that can be in improved our location information. Um, we can see on this location here, we have a unit block west of Dartmouth. Um, block numbers don't really tell us information about which intersection is causing the problem. Um, and we'll have a kind of a real world example of that later. Um, also the harmful event sequence, um, we can see in these two rows here, we don't have any kind of harmful event. We don't know how these vehicles came together um, and that prevents us from easily determining the crash type. Um, additionally, things like road description information, especially in terms of um, driveway access are generally being used uh, fairly appropriately, but when they're uh, missing, that can definitely cause problems. Um, once all is said and done, our, our data looks a lot more like this, where everything is uh, cleaned and uh, has kind of a standard quality to it. Um, we make sure that all of the city and county fields are populated, and we make sure that um, our crash types are corrected. Some of our current challenges include fewer crashes coming through with diagrams. We understand that uh, they're only required for serious bodily injury and uh, fatal crashes, but these are really key in working with complex crashes. Um, I know a lot of this can be tied to uh, record management systems and how uh, those kinds of files get transferred. Um, location information, one thing we're seeing often is uh, we're given uh, coordinates and then there's no reiteration in the location field or in the narrative um, will be given an arbitrary like I-25 coordinate and then it'll say uh, vehicle one was behind vehicle two and they crashed and it's like that doesn't tell us like what area is causing the problem. Um, missing direction, movement, et cetera, for hit and runs. We do have unknown fields for that um, and those are acceptable. Um, in this case, unknown and blank are two different values um, and they mean very different things. Um, and like I mentioned before, using block numbers, um, especially with like interchanges uh, in Greeley alone, Highway 34 and Highway 85 have five different interchanges. So uh, in a report when it says Highway 34 at Highway 85, it's like, which one? <laughs> I don't know which one. Um, so in our geolocating, we have two kind of methods. First, we have our mile markers, um, which we see here under this uh, RD number, which is the highway designation, and then the RD section, which is the actual mile point. Um, we are confident to the third or to the uh, third decimal uh, for the road section, and to the fifth place after the decimal for GPS. Um, 
We require GPS coordinates for all fatal SBI, pedestrian, and bicycle crashes. Um, so we try to make sure that uh, we're incorporating uh, one, uh, as many uh, informative crashes and then as many vulnerable roadway users as we can. Um, in this, we'll also see the ramp designation. So here we have a D ramp and an I ramp. Um, these are very specific. Uh, in this case, we have Parker Road southbound off ramp. Um, and we can see uh, that is specific to the uh, southbound to westbound ramp. Um, our current solution, besides geolocating in this map function that we've developed, um, is a static PDF that <laughs> we use to determine all of our mile markers. Um, we can see here that we have uh, ramp splits, we have the loops, uh, we have uh, where the gore points come together, where they split apart, where they come back together. Um, oops, excuse me. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, so we can see that there's a lot of specificity in um, our geolocating. If anybody has a solution that would make this not static, uh, we literally go into MS Paint and update these. Um, they are out of date as soon as we save them. So if anybody's got a cool idea, uh, definitely reach out. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna take you guys through correcting a standard crash report. Um, this one's pretty average. Uh, we're missing our, we've the our pre-processing has determined that this is pretty likely uh, Highway 88. Um, and it's determining that by reading this Bellevue Avenue um, and then uh, looking at the city and the county population. Um, so those three pieces together allow it to guess that it's, um, highway or state highway 88 um, but we're missing a second location we're given a block number which is kind of vague no lat long um, and judging by the direction this initially looks like a broadside crash but without being able to see the narrative um, it's kind of hard to determine in this case it's a scanned report so when we go into the actual crash uh, we can see that instead of being northbound t1 was actually eastbound and they were at the intersection um, so again having the 3200 block when uh, the 3200 block is actually this barn down here um, when the actual cause is at the intersection um, that kind of explain kind of shows like how much more informative it is to be specific than to just give a generalized block number. And in terms of uh, the way that the cars came together, um, we're really looking for the snapshot from before the crash occurred. Um, so in before where it kind of uh, described how they landed, um, we really want the snapshot before because in this case, what looked like a broadside is actually an approach turn crash. Uh, both of these are considered right away crashes, uh, but the methods that we use to mitigate them are completely different. Um, so that's why the specificity in the location and the actions just before the crash, right when it became unstable, um, that's the snapshot that we're looking for to work with our data. Um, so now that we've cleaned up the record, we have our mile marker, we have our specific highway designation, we have our corrected location two, our corrected uh, TU1 direction, our crash type, um, and our approach turn designation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave so that he can tell you guys about a real world example. Thanks, Alyssa. <clears throat> Great job. Yeah, and, and Alyssa covered a lot of the uh, specifics on the links we go through to improve the data, enhance the data, so we could use it for, for actions like network screening and diagnosis and countermeasure selection for uh, our safety improvement programs, and uh, not, not just identifying where to apply and award funding, but also to examine what happens after we we do a project and come back five years later and see how well it performed. That's part of the process, not just the selection and the economic analysis, but also the self-evaluation. So having that specificity with the, with the data as far as crash type and location, not just not just the severity and and things like that is, is very important. And they're really one of my favorite things to do. This case right here, 
was a city of Lakewood intersection at 14th and Lamar that was awarded 1.1 million of HSIP funding for a roundabout uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, you know, when roundabouts cost 1.1 million, they probably cost at least twice as much now. But uh, periodically, one of our one of our duties here at CDOT is to go back and look at how well these projects functioned to help inform us on future decisions. So, and in this case, this is one of the better examples where we see uh, where the roundabout was implemented somewhere between 2013 and 2015, and in the before and after numbers by crashes by year on the chart showed a dramatic improvement in the reduction of those broadside collision, those right angle crashes and uh, that coding of the crash type to be more specific to, to broadsides with those right angle collisions is, is very telling, uh, as well as the, the, the improvement in the number of uh, injuries reduced for that, for that uh, type of improvement. So, you know, uh, a lot of, a lot of these small successes are drowned out by the overall trends right now. So it, it's good for us to, to, affirm that our decision making and where we apply our funding uh, does work more times than not. And that's that goes into the importance of, of why we go through those lengths of coding that data specifically uh, as well as we can. Um, since, you know, the, the more information we have, the, the better, more effective we could be with our decision making. But, um, with that, I think we're, we're yep. good. <laughs> and so with that, uh, you guys are welcome to reach out to me with any questions. Um, I would put Dave down, but he's already uh, bogged down <laughs> with everybody else's emails. Um, so definitely feel free to reach out to me with any questions and I'm happy to answer a few now, if anybody has any. There's a few in the chat. Oh, I can't see the chat, yeah. hold on. <laughs> Well, I got it, Alyssa. Okay. Um, it looks like, um, so Kyle Hammermeyer from Lakewood is asking, uh, would it be possible to require GPS locations for all crashes? We would love that, but that would definitely be an effort on the officer training side of things because it's not something uh, I can, or CDOT itself can mandate. Um, we would love that though. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. It's like um, post-processing, that would be very difficult. There's just a massive amount of uh, work involved with that. And that's why we limited ourselves to the this, this serious injuries, uh, vulnerable roadway users and fatalities, because that's, you know, you're, you're addressing like four to 5,000 crashes instead of, you know, potentially, you know, 50 to 100,000 crashes and and it does take a while but we're hoping to like to reach out with law enforcement and encourage them to to fill out those gps while they're out in the field and they are they are improving we've seen a dramatic improvement in the last couple of years so it's getting better and also on the post post cross processing side uh, we we do partner uh you know with our 405c traffic records grant program with a lot of local agencies uh like Adams County or Weld County or Colorado Springs to, to uh, geocode their own crashes where there's gaps. And then of course, Dr. Cog also chips in too with their time and, and geocodes their, their, their crashes and sends it back to us so we could fold it in and have a more complete data set. So overall, we, we've been pretty pleased over the last 10 years, the GPS locations are about, um, you know, they, they start out less than 50%, but they end up closer to 80 or 90%. And um, that's good. I mean, and that doesn't speak to the accuracy. That's a diff whole different uh, ball of wax here, uh, a whole different discussion. But uh, certainly we are, we are headed in the right direction on the completeness of the GPS locations. All right, excellent. Uh, another question coming from um, Michelle in Lafayette. Um, this is awesome information. Are these correction methodologies available to share with local police? So not specifically, not yet. Um, I just started in this role uh, 
a little over six and a half months ago. Um, it's definitely something that I want to do um, in terms of uh, teaching officers uh, the best way to uh, collect data that is usable for the engineers. Um, and we certainly understand that like everybody's got a hand in the pot for the, the form and everybody wants specific information. Um, but I wanna make sure that we provide or offer some kind of training that indicates uh, what information is most helpful for our engineers. So um, those kinds of corrections, I'm, I'm hoping to build into some, corn, some kind of informal training eventually. Okay. And then last question in the chat currently, um, Barbara Gabella at CDPHE, are the broadside and injury crashes different crashes or are the injury <laughs> crashes a subset of the broadside? That must be referring to the example and yeah. uh, they were separate. I mean, most of the injuries were attributed to the broadsides, as you would imagine, that's a right angle crash, which generally are more severe than other crash types. But uh, the injury crashes could have been other like off road or um, uh, approach Hitting the turns or, or yep. curbs or whatever. Yep. There is a correlation there for sure. All right, cool. Well, with that, I will stop sharing. Thank you guys so much. We really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to us ramble. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you both. Um, and we are going to, again, keep moving on. Um, we've got a, another great presentation from um, my colleague Jenny um, here, Dr. Cog. I'm going to share this is my screen and manage the slide deck for her one moment please all right is everybody able to see um the screen Yep, we can, Eric. Okay. Okay. Um, and Jenny, are you able? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Jenny Wallace. I'm the GIS manager at Dr. Cog, and I've been involved in processing crash data for um, several years now. So what I wanted to cover today was uh, picking up from DOR's presentation and CDOT's presentation, what Dr. Cog does with the crash data and how we provide that um, on our regional data catalog. So next slide, please, Eric. Real quick, I wanted to touch on the extent of the crash data that Dr. Cog processes. Um, there's a couple of boundaries here. The smallest boundary um, is our MPO boundary. And then we have our... Um, our uh, Council of Governments or COG boundary. The boundary that is the largest includes Clear Creek and Gilpin. And you'll see it will also include um, a portion of Weld County and Albert County. So that's important just because when we process the crash data, we're processing it to what we call the modeling boundary or that largest boundary. So that's the extent that you can expect to see of the crash data. Next, please. So we process uh, crash data straight from CDOT. What that looks like is just an annual request to get the data. And um, I'll go a little bit more into detail, but we uh, have some processing steps, including changing table schema information, um, geocoding off system records, and then flagging high priority records and doing some QC. Once we have the data um, and it's all geocoded and QC'd, then we do publish it to our regional data catalog, which is data.drcog.org. And um, we do have 2020 up on the regional data catalog now as well, in addition to the years that you see mm. there. <clears throat> Next, please. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our uses for the data, just so you all are aware of you know, what we're looking at in terms of regional context and how accurate we need the data to be. There's a couple of things here. Um, first is our uh, act the actual crash point location. So you'll see kind of on the um, 
the regional vision zero map, we've got point locations. I think that is showing the um, killed and serious injury crashes in the region. So we have that on our web map. From that data, we have derived um, what we call the high injury network and critical corridor. So that's on the left there. Um, the uh, high injury network is in the blue, the critical corridors are identified in the orange. We also use crash data for um, some of our other plans like active transportation to understand bicycle and pedestrian crashes. And then we also use fatality information for our, our Metro vision measures. Next, please. All right, so, um, and you know, if, if you've been part of the uh, data consortium or um, regional vision zero work, working groups, you may have heard a lot of um, presentations lately about crash data and uh, our newest data set is the crash 2020 data. And I wanna go into a little bit um, about this because it is certainly different from all of the other years that we've processed. So the crash data form has migrated from the DR2447 to 3447. Um, that's kind of been a, a several year in process. Um, and 2020 was the first time that we had actually seen the schema, um, the underlying table structure change into that new format. So you can just imagine that um, data fields would be different uh, based on the 3447 form as the 2447 form. Um, data is split into a main table, which has the crash information and then three ancillary tables. Uh, and then all of those are re uh, related via foreign and primary keys. And we did add some additional fields. So I'll go into those a little bit in a little bit. Um, and then also, You'll see when you download the data, a data dictionary um, that we provide for all of the year's worth of data that we have on the regional data catalog. Um, what's unique about this one is that it includes the 3447 schema. So we tried to mimic the table structure that, um, that we received, but it also has some 2447 fields in it as well. And certainly the data has a mix of 2447 data and 3447 data. Next, please. Oops. All right, so this um, just details a little bit about the processing steps like I mentioned earlier. So what we're doing is prepping the schema. Um, basically, we do a lot of this in, in Python and in SQL in the back end of a Postgres database. Um, so we insert the data um, that we receive from CDOT into a schema because when we get the data, we actually get it in a CSV format. It used to be that it would come in a DBF format which would preserve field types. The CSV um, changes that a little bit. So we had to do some extra processing on the 2020 data to prepare for that new schema change. Um, and we populate the data, we populate um, some other fields, and then we um, create geometries from the latitude and longitudes that are in the CDOT data. So the on-system records that have been geocoded, um, we just create geometries for those. Then for all of the remaining records where we don't have a latitude and longitude, we clean up the address field. So that would be the, um, the primary road and then the intersecting road. We do some cleanup and standardization of that data so that it's nice and clean when we bring it in to ArcGIS and we geocode it using Esri StreetMap Premium. Then we combine those two back together. So we have one clean data set that has all of our geocodes. Uh, there's some QC that happens in that process as well. And then we're flagging high priority records. Um, for us, that means bicycle, pedestrian, killed and seriously injured. Uh, and then doing a, a final QC of, of that information. Um, yeah, I think that's it for now on that one. Next, please, Eric. All right, so new this cycle with 2020, we moved all of our code base to Python in, an, in a Jupyter notebook. So you can see there um, just the different steps that we have broken out and what that looks like for us. So what's nice about this is that it provides even more automation um, and um, 
sort of QCing abilities than, than we had previously had, and also gives us the ability to share more readily. Um, so if anyone is interested in these scripts, we're happy to share that information out. Um, let's see. Oh, yep, that's fine. So um, this step, so this is kind of step eight, which is replacing values um, and field names. This is also new to 2020. One of the um, critiques that we heard about our crash data was that everything's encoded values. You have to reference the data dictionary in order to understand what those mean. So this year we were really intentional about um, taking those coded values um, and crosswalking them into the readable human format so that when you're looking at the data, um, you're actually looking at text versus versus numbers. Um, I know that one thing for the future that we will be improving is that uh, right now we just kind of, kind of hard coded this as SQL code. Um, and we will be improving that this year by creating lookup tables and just making that process a little bit cleaner. Next, please. So what that looks like from this perspective is if you look on the left here, we've got the road description. Once we've applied that code that crosswalks that information, then you've got the road description again and what those values actually mean. What I wanted to point out here was that there's a couple of records on the, on the right side that you'll see where the numbers still exist. And that um, is actually a really good uh, QC step for us because then it tells us that we don't have a correlating value like that number seven value doesn't have a correlating um, description for it. So that might be something like um, maybe it's just a data entry error or there could be something else like maybe there's a missing value of the field uh, of the data dictionary. Um, so next please. All right. So if you download the Crash 2020 from the Regional Data Catalog, this is what you can expect to see in that download. There is a file geo database that's an Esri proprietary um, data set. Uh, then you will see some documentation describing the 3447 changes and um, common codes, and then also our crash data guide, which is just kind of a one, two pager that describes our process and um, some of the things that really I'm covering here. And then also the um, uh, 3447 and 2447 uh, data dictionaries. So I mentioned that there were some ancillary tables that go along with the crash table. Uh, you'll see this in the geo database. There's the crash 2020 data set. And then we have the non-motorist occupant and vehicle table. So the crash table is the main information, the location, that's where your latitude and longitude are gonna be. And this is also gonna be where the um, Dr. F Dr. Cog created fields are. Non-motorist is info about each non-motorist involved in the crash, such as type, safety equipment, things like that. Then um, we've got an occupant table, info about each occupant in the vehicle um, or traffic unit ID. And, uh, and then the vehicle table, information about that, such as um, vehicle type, things like that. Next, please. Oh, was that the next slide? Oh, okay, there we go. Um, okay, so this is the, the table relationships. From the crash table, we have an ID field, and that is linked to the um, vehicle table via the crash ID as the, the foreign key, and the same, same goes on the non-motorist. So you've got ID in your crash table, relates to crash ID in the non-motorist and the vehicle table. And then the vehicle table is linked to the occupant table uh, via the foreign key traffic unit VID. Next. So these are some of the Dr. Cog created fields that I mentioned. All of this is going to be available in the crash table. So first we have Dr. Cog, everything's prefaced by Dr. Cog. So then underscore HP is, um, I'm sorry, I must have a typo here. The, the Dr. Cog HP is, uh, indicates high priority. So I mentioned earlier that that is bicycle pedestrian um, killed and seriously injured. Uh, and then I, we, we should have had a, a line break there, but Dr. Cog non-motorist, so NMSI is serious injuries of non-motorists. 
Um, and then uh, Dr. Cog, non-motorist killed is uh, that, I'm sorry, I've got my, my, my um, lines messed up here, but, and then you've got in the occupant um, area, we've got the number of occupants that are killed and the number of occupants that are seriously injured. And then we total those up to get total KSIs. So total killed, total serious injuries is a combination of the non-motorists and the occupants. And then we've also included um, a bike and pedestrian, whether the um, crash involved a bicycle or a pedestrian. And that was actually a, a combination of looking at all of the, um, the sequence codes on the harmful events, because it doesn't like, you need to look at almost like all of those sequence codes. I think there's four or five of them in order to determine if the crash was at all involving a bike or pedestrian. Next, please. Okay, so um, future processing, uh, we recognize that even when we're geocoding those off system records, right now they are not tied to a linear referencing system. A couple years back, I tried to at least change the data like based on the link field. So if the data says this intersection, but 200 feet south of that, then I would kind of move the point 200 feet south, but it wasn't following a linear reference system. So um, it, it did um, introduce some errors. And so we decided to really take a step back and make sure that we were doing that correctly by integrating with a linear referencing system. So that is our hope that we will be working on that for 2021 um, and improving our locations. Um, Another thing that we'll be focusing on is more QC and um, sort of that preliminary checks of, uh, of the data and just making sure that everything looks good. And I'll also say with that and sort of coordinating with Alyssa at CDOT that um, we're probably gonna be looking at more like iterative feedback with them just to say like, okay, well, these are the things that we're checking, provide that information back to them so that they can put it in their queue as, as priorities allow. Um, and then also, like I mentioned, improving code just to streamline that process, taking uh, SQL statements, long iterative SQL statements and, and cleaning up that code so it's, uh, so it's easier for us to interpret. And hopefully if anyone is interested in the code, um, that it's easier for them to implement. I think that's it. Um, so thank you. Are there any questions? Hey, Jenny. Hi, this is Jacob. Um, we do have a question in the chat from Alyssa at CDOT. Um, she'd love to learn about how we do road name cleanup. That's something that their developer is having a hard time with. Yeah, it can be, you, you guys can show me at another time, but basically uh, in our old system um, using Fox Pro, we had the ability not necessarily to mass edit, but we had the ability to like rearrange the road location names and that was really helpful. And we haven't been able to find a way short of like finding and replacing and uh, mm. like manually changing and updating the locations, uh, which is extremely tedious. And so if you guys have any kind of automation, that would be lovely. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Alyssa, we do have automation. We've been using this um, this kind of code for um, at least as long as I've been at Dr. Cog for ten years, um, and it's I'll, I'll I'll share with you offline. But just uh, for everyone, it's a, a series of scripts, SQL code that is managed in a Postgres database. We have lookup tables that would say, you know, if s uh, if st is there, you know, you parse everything out by spaces. So if you have st for street find it, replace it with the street. So it is it is a very, um, very much automated find and replace system, but it works pretty well. So yes, I will share that with you. Awesome, thank you so much. Sure. Awesome, thank you so much, Jenny. Um, are there any, any other questions for Jenny? Uh, yes, uh, can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah. Yes, go ahead to hear. Yeah, I, I have an e computer, so I was struggling to get in this morning. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am wondering this is for Jenny. Uh, 
uh, this is really great what you guys are doing, uh, Dr. Cog. I'm wondering, uh, CDAD is the, uh, uh, you get the data from CDAD, obviously, and then you do what you're doing with the data. That's great. Uh, is the goal here, and again, maybe Eric already told me and I kind of forget about it, is the ultimate goal for Dr. Cog to create a crash data uh, repository, maybe a warehouse, and your members can come in and they have the access and they can get the, the whatever crash data they need, uh, which means that they don't really need to go to see that. Is that the goal? What exact, or is this just Dr. Cog's, Dr. Cog's uh, own use of the data? Yeah. Well, well, thanks to here. Certainly, uh, certainly one of our goals is to process the data and help our member governments and help the public that are interested in this data um, to be able to have it in a geocoded uh, in a geocoded shapefile um, so that they don't have to go to CDOT. It, certainly, we we also use the data for our purposes, as I mentioned, for our metrics and you know activities such as um, regional vision zero. Um, so, so we certainly use the data, but yes, it is it is definitely one of our goals to provide a service to our member governments and and the public uh, that want access to this data. I I would say that um, I think as we evolve, and you know, certainly the the process from CDOT and from Dr. Cog, as we continue to evolve, and there may come a time where. The geocoding from our side is not necessary anymore. Like for instance, if CDOT were doing that, or uh, as it was mentioned previously, if latitudes and longitudes are provided um, from our you know, original data source, meaning the police forms, uh, the 3447, then we wouldn't have to do a lot of geocoding. So I would say you know, one particular goal for this consortium is that we come together and realize what these issues are and work to address them from um, from those higher levels so that the processing doesn't have to be done um, by multiple people. I will say that even though Dr. Cog is processing this data, um, as Dave mentioned, there's 405C grants to work with vendors um, and some local jurisdictions are doing that so that they can get data um, that is geocoded as well. So, I, you know, I think that there's a lot of process improvement. There's a lot of duplication of effort. And, you know, uh, m certainly my goal is to, to firm that up and um, Clean it all up for the region. Thank you. That's exactly what I was getting at. You know, I mean, see, that's doing something obviously, and I, sometimes I was struggling. Is what Dr. Cox is doing different? Uh, what I mean by when you do the data analysis, I know see that does uh, data analysis as well uh, for use. You know, to for highway safety use. And I was kind of wondering, is what Dr. Cox is doing a little different than I know you're doing geocoding and all of that great stuff. Is what CDAT's doing different from what the Tacoc's doing? Is there a, is there a uh, duplication here? Could this could this be could CDAT and the Tacoc work together as one? You know, I don't know. You know, I, I was just asking the question. This is something yeah, I've been struggling with for years, as they always say. Thank you. But, but <laughs> I, I know, I know. Hi, to hear. This is Jacob Rieger. Um, I really appreciate your questions. Those are all good questions. And they're, frankly, you know, some of the primary purposes of this regional crash data consortium effort, right? How can we all work together better? But just, you know, Jenny's answer was great, but just to add some flavor from a transportation planning perspective, and to be clear, I mean, this is a partnership, as I hope has been demonstrated in these three presentations together um, about the, the long and winding path of processing crash data, right? But from the Dr. Cog perspective, we do process all of the off-system crash data for the entire Dr. Cog region. We work with CDOT um, and, you know, and with DOR to create a unified data set of crash data for the entire Dr. Cog region, primarily intended for public use um, as, as a resource to all of our local governments, of stakeholders, members of the public, as well as our own internal use for our own transportation planning, um, our MPO planning functions, our federal requirements and whatnot. So it is meant to be, in a sense, sort of that I don't know if I'd say primary database, but meant to be that regional resource, uh, both internally and externally for folks who need it. And one of the purposes of this crash data consortium is to sort of, you know, work together to think through how can we sort of better do all the things that the three presenters have talked about this morning? How can we use this data better? Um, how can we process it more accurately, faster? Um, how can we use it better together as a region? Um, but yes, it is meant to be a primary data source internally and externally for uh, crash data analysis in the Dr. Cog region. 
So I hope that helps answer at least some of your questions. Thanks, Jacob. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. And Chenny as well. And right, thanks for that. Um, and Kenneth, uh, did you have a, a quick question? Um, I saw your hand raised a moment ago. Oh, I was um, I was just curious as if um, there was any uh, issues when looking at the latitude and longitude provided, um, of distinguishing between whether or not that's the location of the crash or the location of the officer patrol car. Um, given like where that data comes from when it's provided on that. Uh, on that. I can speak to that a bit. Um, yeah. So in general, uh, we we do go into each individual record and we try to confirm that the the coordinate given is uh, at least related to the the crash. Yeah. Um, occasionally, you know, we'll see officers uh, filling out reports and the GPS coordinate is at their home address because that's where <laughs> they filled out the report. Um, so that's oh, definitely no. um, an officer training thing. If we do catch that or like the GPS coordinate ends up in the middle of a field, uh, we'll try to catch those and correct them. But it's it's a, on a individual record basis. And so it's definitely a challenge on our end as well. I, thank you. That's what always worried me. <laughs> yeah, we're. It's definitely something we want to uh, focus on going forward in terms of like training and like how to collect it. Um, you know what we're looking for in terms of like uh, you know GPS coordinate at the point of impact, but we don't want anybody like you know trying to get out with their laser measurement on a snowy road in the middle of the night like we don't we don't need that kind of accuracy you know just generalized yeah no, thank you all right thank you and there was one last thing in the chat just wanted to address um cameron but weld county is asking would it be possible to add a column to the data or maybe like an aka also known as for roadways with multiple names for example, First Street is also known as County Road 3, situations like that. So there is, um, this is definitely a problem for us as well. And, and um, if anyone's interested, I can certainly uh, bring up uh, the screen for it. Um, but in our road definitions, uh, we do have um, a search where we're able to, like let's say the example that I showed of Bellevue at Glenwood Drive, um, we can have the, the um, we can have the search pull up all of the mile points for uh, Route 88, um, and then we can go in there and search for Glenmore Drive, and that will allow us to get um, that kind of stuff. Uh, and if it is, uh, if it has an alias, we can include that in the search field. Um, but in terms of like how that's exported into the report, uh, I don't think we could add that column because it would be. Uh, I don't want to say redundant, but that's the best word I can think of off the top of my head. Okay. Okay, great. All right. Thank you for that context, Alyssa. And thank you um, for all the questions. And thank you, Jenny. We are getting there, almost there. Um, let me just go ahead and um, pull up the rest of mine. Um, All right, is everyone able to see my screen now? Not yet, Eric. Not yet, Eric. Okay. There we go. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. All right. So as noted um, earlier, so we, Dr. Craig has been engaged in this inventory process and has had the opportunity to speak with many stakeholders across the region and states. Um, very briefly going to go over um, some of our engagement numbers and then speak to some high level points on our inventory. I'm going through some of the data sources used, some analysis cases we've heard, um, issues and problems we've heard, a few um, other relevant points of information, and I'll very briefly show uh, kind of a working model of how how data is used around around the or flows around the region. Uh, through this, we've had the opportunity to speak with over 120 
individual people. Um, we've engaged through multiple means through several surveys that have gone out, one before the official start of this that informed some of the questions we had later on, um, and two large surveys that we had a great response rate on, and a number, of, about 35, 36 um, individual calls with stakeholders. Um, with Some of those had multiple individuals included, um, so we were able to speak with a lot of people in the region, fortunately. Here is a brief breakdown of kind of the the way, places these conversations were from. Um, as you can see, the lion's share for both uh, individual responses and types of organizations were um, from local municipalities, um, the state, county, and kind of going down there. And we've had a chance to speak with people in fire districts, um, some of the vendors, some higher education, um, and others. Some, a lot of this has already been covered um, through the great presentations um, earlier this morning, but some of the main data sources used, again, are going to be that CDOT data sets, um, the data sets from Dr. Cog, um, the data that is being produced by municipal police, um, sheriffs, and Colorado State Patrol. Um, we've heard, we, my understanding is that the majority of crashes in incorporated areas are responded to by State Patrol, but there are instances where sheriffs do. Um, there are several vendors that um, provide data um, and data processing and cleaning for municipalities and organizations in the region. Um, the two main ones that we've um, heard used by our stakeholders are Crash Magic, APD Programming, and Diaxis, um, both of them using different sources of data, um, but providing services to governments and organizations. And there are also other um, sources coming from fire districts and departments, hospitals, and emergency departments. These are not really used in some quite the same ways that some of the engineering is, and there are certainly issues with HIPAA and sharing that we'll address later. Um, but there's um, kind of a world out there as well to tap into potentially. And the last thing I want to mention is just the fatal analysis reporting system, FARS, um, which data is uplate, updated to from CDOT in order to attempt an attempt to have a really a standardized accounting of number of fatal crashes in states that is used to compare between states. One of the most I think one of those insightful things I think we learned is that almost all the organizations we talked to use very multiple sources of data. Um, I don't think anyone we talked to said they really only use CDOT or only use their municipal. Um, there's a quite a mix. Um, one one local government on the west side of the metro described how they use our Dr. Cog data to look at critical corridors and examine how they compare with other communities. Um, they use CDOT data when working with CDOT and, and in conversation with them. And they use their municipal records to dive into their street system and look at crash patterns and look at the individual crashes happening. So this is a brief example of how all these sources are used and interconnected. We have developed a really unique um, web map and dashboard that I'll share a link out to um, with all of you at the conclusion of, or um, later on. Um, our call, my colleague Byron Schultz has put it together. It really is meant to demonstrate the various use, ways that data is used by different municipalities, counties, and other governments. And I'm really excited about how this came out. And I'd like to preview it here, but um, I will be sending that link out to you. And if you are a representative or part of any of these organizations and you feel that the data there is not correct or um, something is missing, um, please reach out to me and I would love to get that updated. There are several real overarching use cases for crash data in, in the region that I'm sure will come as not a surprise. Um, one of the largest being that of engineering, um, really looking to identify areas, dangerous areas and areas with excessive crashes. Um, sometimes this is borne out through intentional safety studies in response to individual crashes, or if there's a resurfacing, a safety study might be a part of that and looking at the crash data. Um, and this is often used to justify Traffic engineering interventions for crashes, such as perhaps installing leading pedestrian intervals, um, timing, changing signal timing, or even potentially redesigning entire intersections. And quick wins, such as if there's examples of maybe there are appropriate signage, but it's being obstructed by plants or other objects. Um, we've heard from stakeholders uh, that the data is used for even quick wins such as that. Um, crash is used as an educational format as well to inform system users of um, dangerous areas and intersections, as well as looking at the behavioral factors such as the safety equipment Jenny mentioned earlier, such as seatbelts, um, and just uh, being aware of different things that can contribute to crashes and help mitigate them. 
And also importantly, crash data is used by uh, many local police departments um, and the Colorado State Patrol um, in order to help direct patrols and help make sure that enforcement is at places where they've observed that crashes are happening at higher frequencies. Can you announce some major objectives? Um, these are mainly in the engineering realm, um, but engineering and planning realm. But a lot of this has come from looking to identify um, crash location of the patterns, try to see what kind of crashes are occurring, and then understanding the crashes. As it comes to the identifying, um, we've heard that many governments are using this crash data to locate hotspots, um, to look at their perhaps their top 10 um, intersections or roadway stretches where they're having crashes. Um, there is some statistical modeling going in um, on some, many levels about where maybe the crashes are in excess of what could be expected based on the volume of roadways. Um, and then really digging into the individual crashes themselves um, when they have a pattern identified or, or if there's a particular um, serious crash um, that they feel could be addressed um, in the future. Um, we've heard that oftentimes the number and severity of crashes is needed um, to be kind of borne out in numbers in order to meet thresholds for different interventions um, with city councils or with other parts of their city. So it's important for those funding uh, projects. And this historical data of where crashes occur is used to inform systemic approaches wherein Individuals can look at where if there's crashes that are happening on roadways that share similar features, they need to look for those features elsewhere in their jurisdiction and be able to hopefully put in some proactive measures. Looking at the once we know where once our stakeholders are knowing where crashes are happening, they're really digging into what kind. Um, there's a fact there's a focus a lot on the the movements of crashes, um, the harmful event sequences, as was explained earlier, and really just trying to understand what types of units traffic are involved, um, motor vehicles, bicycles, um, pedestrians. Um, and really, the idea being all the factors need to be examined, not just the frequency of crashes. Along the lines of this, understanding the, understanding the crashes um, to inform the right solutions the design of the roadway is often considered um, roadway conditions such as the sight lines between traffic units and signage or, or street lights or other units. Um, the day and time of year, including lighting, can be important. Um, and even the, the surface treatment of intersections, um, we've heard engineers describing how that may be something to reconsider if there's a number of crashes happening in a spot, that's something that is looked at to determine if there's an issue to be solved there, as well as looking at the signal network. And finally, with the understanding, um, we, we've heard from many stakeholders that they're really looking also into the behavioral factors that they are able to discern from the crash reports and narratives, um, seeing if impairment is involved, um, if speeding, um, other distracted driving is involved, because we've we have, uh, we've noted had noted by some stakeholders that that can affect the type of intervention that might be going into an area where maybe looking at a a, a points um, on a map it, from first glance it may indicate oh perhaps a bulb out could help or some sort of the traffic calming might help in one area but maybe lighting is a more appropriate response it's just an example we've heard so really trying to understand where um, what and, and how of course these crashes are is the main analysis goals along this though We've been asking about some of the issues and problems that are being encountered by stakeholders, and they really come down to location accuracy, um, timeliness of data, the consistency, discrepancies that are discovered, and the difficulty in linking data. Location accuracy and timeliness are probably the biggest things we've heard, most, the most, um, most common responses we've got. Um, as described earlier, there are several methods for citing a crash. Um, and as described earlier, off-system data from CDOT is not geocoded. Um, Dr. Cog does that for many crashes, for all the crashes, and also many governments are working on their own data. Um, but still, some governments um, do not have access to that geocoded crash data, whether their police department is not recording it, or they don't have they don't have access to do it themselves, or they're unaware that some of this data is available in other sources. Um, 
We've heard that the address is sometimes listed as for location, whether that's coming from an officer entering it by themselves or if that's coming from their computer aided dispatch. But that's often described as not being um, useful for, for data users on the back ends. Um, timeliness is, an, is another one of the, again, one of the large things we've heard. Um, we have the state data, as we know, goes through a long, long process to um, get to the point where, where it is available. Um, but we've heard from many of our stakeholders that their constituents and local decision makers are expecting more in, more recent more information. Um, we heard from one stakeholder that it's almost impossible to gain understanding from residents when you're using data that is one and a half or more years old. They want to reference recent crashes, not trends from three years ago. And that said, some of these longer trends are useful for longer term statistical analysis, but that is something that we have heard from many people and why in a lot of ways some of these governments are often relying on their municipal data if it's available to them. The consistency of reporting is the third large thing, and whether that's the method of location, um, even within certain departments, we have heard that the some records maybe have good, great location at a geo at a latitude, latitude, and some may just have a five to three hundred feet west of intersection, whatever. Um, and so parsing through that can be time consuming for users. Um, spelling and naming conventions is another thing. Um, I remember one stakeholder saying, asking how many ways I could spell Mississippi, and also just bringing up that West 38th and W 38th, while they mean the same thing, it takes another step to make sure that those are reconciled in a lot of these systems. The narratives are seem to be used inconsistently, um, and we've heard that they've been very useful for analysis, so that's something that's wanted to mention. Um, the impairment suspected is another issue that has been brought up by several stakeholders. Um, their officers are supposed, or in the officer training manual and the training, um, if the officer suspects alcohol, drugs, or marijuana, they are too put that down on, on the form, but we've heard that there's a reluctance among some to put that unless it's basically like a slam dunk that they can prove it. And that's not the intention of the form. And so there's a, there's a, there's a discrepancy in how things are being reported there. And then just the overall level of completeness and detail in how the reports are filled out um, between officers um, as they go to DOR. Um, and one thing, one another line I, I remember was, someone bringing up that you know a dedicated traffic officer is probably going to be providing a better um more, more a higher level of detail than maybe a regular uh, patrol who might be the first closest person to respond to a crash so but there are efforts around the the region that are really cool to kind of bring up that level of level of training um, among different departments i just want to touch on some discrepancies we've heard um again one of these kind of involves that um the impairment data, but the state um, is not always getting updated information from local governments. Um, there is a process, as Aaron described, but sometimes things even come out past the in in, in the legal stages of a crash or in um, toxicology through finding things out from coroners even. And and if things don't get if if a new form if an update isn't provided to DOR, there's really no way that. CDOT will find out about it. There's no way to get that updated. Um, no, no, no real easy way to get that updated. And so um, we've just heard that there's some discrepancy even among the numbers of fatal and serious crashes in municipalities and CDOT data, um, bike and pedestrian crashes not being recorded the same way. And again, these some crashes involving um, people who are under impaired. And then just the last um, problem issue I wanted to go over is um, we've heard um, described that there's a difficulty in linking data. There's a lot of data out there, as I brought up at the beginning, um, but there's not a real good um, or not at all um, real system for unique identifiers. Um, there's been some really novel efforts to um, done by CDPHE to try to link um, hospital admissions that were from crashes or, or potentially from crashes with crashes, but there were some linking was able to be done, but there's still a deficit. There was still a deficit there, and this is probably likely leading to an underreporting of bike and pedestrian crashes. Where, for example, if someone is involved 
in a crash and it's never, it's not, maybe not serious enough or they don't, at the time, they don't feel it's serious enough to involve the police. They perhaps show up at an uh, emergency department later that day and reports what happens, but to the hospital, but that doesn't make its way into a police report, a DR-3447 that goes to DOR and ultimately um, CDOT or Dr. Cog or to the municipal governments. Um, just one quick thing to bring up. Um, we've heard that there are relationships between some data users and their law enforcement um, are very, very greatly. I uh, heard described from one as the relationship being phenomenal to another that the, their law enforcement is not super willing to give up the crash data to them, to the extreme example of one um, local government saying that they've actually used open records requests to get data at times. Um, but there's been a pretty universal recognition. I would, actually, I would say universal recognition that the, the work being done by law enforcement is very difficult, um, very important, and that um, they recognize that the task at hand, especially responding to a crash in a roadway, um, there's a lot going on, and then the safety of the officer is important. Um, but there's the and there's the interest desire that um, officers and law, law enforcement understand that the data that they're, they're collecting is very useful, um, and it, it will it is used by people ultimately to try to improve this roadway safety. And then just Latin last thing before we move on to the model is just talking about how the accessibility of data and tools. Uh, we've heard from some people through this process that they're unsure um, where to get data, um, how to use it. Um, we've heard that there's others who are in, um, have shared that there's a lot of data out there. That some There's a lot more data out there than some people realize, and they just might not know how to get it. And this data is really important, not just for those individual projects, um, but, but to fund some of these projects, um, including for highway safety improvement programs, um, for the transportation improvement program that we run. And we've heard from some local governments that the state data is pretty important for their capital improvement program planning. Um, and so getting that data in time for their budgeting cycles um, is important. And just also want to note that um, Dr. Cog is such a huge region with um, so many different types of governments and organizations um, that some lack the capacity of others in the region. So again, another reason why this project I think is so important and grateful that there's so many folks here today. I want to share this, but not linger on it too long. I know it's got a lot going on with it, um, but I just wanted to really kind of highlight how a lot of these data flows are so interconnected and there's many different routes where things can go down. Um, I, will, I will be sharing this out. Um, we'll be sharing the slides out at the after this presentation. So if you time to look at it then and please ask me any questions. But again, typically if a, a crash occurs, it's reported to a police, police respond, investigate with a DR-3447, and that goes through various record management systems or a paper form to DOR. If there's issues, it'll incomplete, it'll go back, amendments, DOR maintains the record, goes to CDOT, they do a lot of fantastic work on that and to produce their data set, which goes to us to do some work on. It's able to be accessed by local governments, um, their different, um, Division Zero suite of DXS utilizes that data, and that's one route. Um, some organizations will use other uh, software vendors that will sort of skip this process in, initially and really just use the police data. And so I really just wanted to, to show this because it's helping me to understand how complicated and complex um, the, the system is, but I think it's something that is important to that we're all working together on. That is the rest of the, the that's all my inventory. I'll, hopefully I have a few minutes for questions till the end, but there's one, one last thing I wanna, or two last things I wanna get to. Um, if you'll remember from the beginning, uh, this, um, we had used um, a Mensimeter code to, um, to, really, to really, um, get started with this meeting. And so if you still have that pulled up, um, please go to that tab or on your smartphone, or also if you're able to go to menti.com and enter these eight digits above. Um, we have a couple of just real quick questions to ask. Um, we were part of our charge was to um, develop mission, vision, mission statements for um, the consortium. And so 
this is really based on feedback that we've received throughout this process. And so we'd, um, we'd really like to just have, some, if you have a response to this, how it resonates with you, um, this vision. And I will say it out. Um, for, I know some folks aren't able to see the screen, but the vision that we came up with was the consortium is a sustainable and a valuable resource to further local and regional roadway safety goals by facilitating collaboration and developing high quality data for the Denver region. Oh, and thank you, Jacob, for putting that in the chat again. Okay, I've got some good responses. Great. All right, and Okay, and I'm gonna move on to the next um, prompt. Um, same, same form as this, thank you for this. Um, and this will be saved. And so we'll be able to, to access this later on. So I really appreciate everyone who's put something in today. The next one is really about mission. I know vision and mission often feels similar, um, <laughs> but, um, we do have another statement here, um, and I'll just read it out again to those who are unable to view a screen. Uh, the mission we craft drafted was to bring stakeholders in the Denver region together and improve crash data collection, processing, and analysis to reduce traffic fatalities and serious injuries. Stakeholders will share expertise and resources to address commonly identified issues of crash data, such as timeliness, accuracy, consistency, and accessibility. All right, we got one in, resonates well. Well, see that. <laughs> As work pans out, work with new stakeholders. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I know we're right about on time, but I just have one last thing. Um, I will I think it's best if I, I'll send this one out as an email to you all um, for a little re, um, response. Um, so just want to cover one last little bit. Um, we do, we are planning on con continuing this work. Um, but the plan is by September 2023 to develop a needs assessment based on this inventory I shared um, and really digging into the data. Um, we're going to identify needs of the region, prioritize these needs, and really try to work to understand the available resources. Um, we'll be publishing a report of this inventory and analysis um, and having another meeting um, like this and invite all of you to join and participate. And then really over the next 
count the next uh, fiscal year, October 2023 to 20, September 2024, we'll be working on um, developing solutions and implementing these solutions. Um, this, as we're calling this our, our consortium, you know, we are really um, relying on the continued support of you all and wanting to be a resource for you all to make sure that this we, we can work together to um, achieve achieve the the mission and vision that we're what we settle that we eventually settle upon and again we can't do that without all the all the great participation from you all today and over the last several months really appreciate the having had the opportunity to speak with so many of you and with that i would like to just um, conclude and i'm available um still to answer any questions um anybody has i know we're right at um 11 30 so if anyone is able to stay and ask any questions um please feel free to to stay on but if not thank you for joining and we look forward to continuing this work together yeah hey eric and everyone i just want to thank you all um, as well for joining today um, but also thank eric for all his hard work on this for facilitating this um, Jenny Wallace and the other presenters who presented today this was all really great yes so thank you all very much Yes, thank you, Jacob. And again, thank you to um, Aaron, David, Alyssa, and Jenny for those really high quality presentations earlier. Really appreciate it. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but or any hands up. But again, I'll stay on just a moment. And then if anybody would like to ask anything, um, please ask or shoot me an email. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Great job, Eric. Cool. Thank you.